Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. It's wonderful to just know that this is the middle of the year. God has kept us from January up till now. And just to let you know, we're going to have some incredible time of praise and worship. Even after the message, we're going to thank the Lord. Uh, and just to let, just, 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 we're going to just really thank the Lord. I want to take a picture of yourself. I hope you're wearing your native attire with yourself or your family. Send the picture to us on social media. Send it. Let's know how you're taking the pictures. Praise God. At this time, we're going to receive our tithe and offering at this time. And let me say something to you quickly before we give. One of the things I want to consider giving into today is our End Hunger Project. Um, the COVID-19 has continued and people are still, you know, people, some people have lost their job, lost salaries, and people are struggling. I want to say that, will you consider, you know, an average, per, an average family, they get a bag, you know, the package of 15,000 naira, it will be able to sustain them for about two to three weeks. So I want to say to you that if you consider sponsoring a family, you can sponsor 10 families at this season. But also we'd like to receive our tithe and offering. So if you want to give to that, and let me say something to you. Jesus Christ said something. He said, when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, he said, you saw me and you fed me. He said, because of that, come to my right hand side. He, and others say, when did we see you? He said, whatever you do for your neighbor, and what are you doing for your neighbor today? So as we're helping people, you can be part of it. You may not be able to come out, but you can be part of it, helping to feed people, uh, feed a family for three weeks with about 15,000 naira. Say so you can do something with raw food stuff. Some of them will come on a weekly basis and just get cooked food from us. Praise the Lord. I also want to give our Titan offering at this time. You know, and someone says, why do we give at this season? The reason is simple. We're not given because we have, we're not given because we feel like it's a sign of our worship. It's a sign of our faith. Fear always holds us from keep giving, but faith always encourages us to give. And as you give today, you know, I've had several testimonies of people. I even, I even had a testimony today of a lady, and she, she was even connecting from um, out of the country. She said, right now, from the job I have now, what I earn in a month, what I used to earn in a year, is now what I earn in a month, in a month. Just imagine this during the season. This is amazing. Let's go ahead and pray. So the banking, these are on the screen. If you're from outside the country, you want to use your card to give, you can go to the website. You can just type your debit or credit card numbers and use it to give. The instructions are there. And if you want to give, you can transfer to the account to the screen even now. If it's going to be a problem, you can take a picture and you can do it later right on the piece of paper. Let's go ahead and pray together. Our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you because you are the provider of all things. And in faith today, we'll bring our tithe and our offerings. And some of us are going an extra step to feed one family, five families during this period. And the Bible says, he that gives to the poor lends unto God. And pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you open up the window of heaven so much that everyone here, both the tithers, the givers, those supporting the poor, will have so much in store. Our testimony is this, that when others say there's a casting down, we will say there's a lifting up in Jesus Christ. Mighty name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And while we're doing that, just the account will be on the screen. While we're doing that, I want to really encourage you that our, um, our fasting and prayer. So we had a fasting and prayer, you know, um, this month and, and another one comes up next month. And so in July, from the first, all the way from the first towards the Sunday, we're going to fast and pray all together. So I want to encourage you, will you join me in praying 6.30 a.m. every morning and 9 p.m. every evening? Anywhere you're watching from, just join. So we're going to fast every day from that time. Then next Sunday is going to be a powerful prayer and communion service. So after we have fasted and prayed, it's going to a powerful prayer and communion service. I hope you remember this because I look forward to be part of it. If you need some help, we have more information for you at this time. Glory to God. So remember, next Sunday, we want to get some wine and bread together in the house because we take the communion to powerful. Last time we took the communion, several, several people were healed from eye conditions to tumors being healed to jobs being gotten. I mean, to the power of the devil broken in people. And I believe that this testimony can start from your house. This time around in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, amen. So, to Today, I want to talk to you about what we're continuing in our teaching on the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're continuing our teaching on the leading of the Holy Spirit. So today, I want to talk to you about how the Spirit connects you with strategic relationships and opportunities. How the Spirit of God connects you with strategic relationships and opportunities. You know, um, the thing, when it comes to the Christian work, 
and how the Spirit of God guides us into productivity, one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of Christians are not well thought in that area. They really know that God can bless them. They really know that God can guide them into productivity, that God can practically make them the head and not the tail. But for a lot of Christians, this is not the experience. So the reason is simple because a lot of people think that that transformation where they'll become productive is kind of magical. They think I'll just fold my hands like this and I will make the top in my company. I'll just be sleeping and the breakthrough will come in my sleep. That's not what the Bible says. There is a pattern and procedure in which the Spirit of God helps you connect into opportunities that will bring you about into greatness. One of the things the Spirit of God does is this. It guides us, it guides us by connecting us with strategic relationships and opportunities. So the first thing I want to say is this. What is a strategic relationship? This is not the kind of relationship that I'm dating now. Well, they know that's not what I'm talking about, strategic. Or, you know, I know someone, that's not strategic. When you're talking about a strategic relationship, three things will really happen. Number one, there will be an assistance to get to your next level. There will be a support system. There will be a connection so that will bring to the next level. There will be a building, a capacity building that will bring to the next level. What will happen is that these relationships are the relationship we look back at and says, these are the steps that God used for me to get next level. And the truth is this, the higher you go up in life, one of the ways the Spirit of God brings about promotion in your life is that He brings certain persons into your life and those persons, one of the things they do, they become a step for you to get to destiny. When you are in this strategic relationship, the first thing it does for you is this, it increases your visibility. That's what it does. This strategic relationship increases of visibility. Where they have not noticed you before, all of a sudden, God connects you with someone that has some kind of platform, has some kind of visibility, and you become visible. I don't know if you know the story of Bishop G.D. Jakes. He had preached for many years at the backside of the desert. Nobody knew him. But somehow, um, the owners of TPN was able to get just a clips of a message he preached at the conference. And that clips of a message was what changed his life completely. Just through a relationship, he was able to come into visibility. So this strategy Strategic relationship brings you into visibility. You know what the Bible, you know, you know, you know what's you know something we would have never heard of Joshua if not for Moses that brought him into visibility. So there are some people that God will just put in your life, and one of the ways you it will walk through them is that they will just give you light. They will just give you a stage. They will just recommend you. You can be building houses and someone will say, oh wow, do you know that person built houses? And through that, see, the person that gave his ability might not be able to offer you something but the person they recommend you can cause you an explosion. That's one of the things those relationships do. The second thing is this, the more you are visible, the more you have opportunities because this strategic relationship will open opportunities to you. You know, let me say something to you. If not for Abraham, we will never know a man called Lot. And Lot forgot that. And as soon as he left Abraham, listen, Lot left Abraham because he thought he would be more successful. But Lot came out of Sodom and Gomorrah. He lost his wife. He lost all his money. All he came out with were his two kids. He had lost everything. I'm saying so that when you are in this strategic relationship, one of the things it does for you is that it opens opportunity to you. You know, a good example is David. David was in a strategic relationship and before you know it, David was already in the, in, the, in the king's palace, but Saul did not even notice him. But guess what? The Bible says the day that David pulled down Goliath, Goliath was David's opportunity. And it was still a strategic relationship that got him there. It was him saying to some people, let me see what's going on there. As soon as he opened, guess what? He pulled down Goliath, a song went throughout Israel. I'm saying so because when I say that the Spirit of God, how the Spirit of God connects with strategic relationships, I want to know something fundamental that what I'm talking about today has the capacity to change your life forever. I'm telling you, if you're able to understand that the way the Spirit of God will bring profit, will take him next level, will bring about promotion to my life, is that he will bring some strategic relationship to my life He will that will open up opportunities. You will be careful about number one, who you connect yourself to. Then number two, the people that you connect yourself to, that God is there, how you detach yourself from there. The other thing that this relationship will do is support. It's support. You know, when God brings you into this relationship, there's an amount of support that they give you that is amazing. Of course, apart from that, 
this relationship would also build you up. Sometimes you can become complacent and think that I'm doing so well, you know, this and this. But when God brings you to a relationship or some of your peers, and you see the dimensions of progress that they've made, this is not carnal comparison. This is just inspiration. You're like, my God, I can go farther. And also, this kind of relationship, what they do is very powerful. As you are in that relationship, when people are exchanging ideas, when they're exchanging thoughts and talking about the problems they have, what happens to you is that you begin to get ideas, your mental capacity begins to become expanded. One of the things that God did for me when I said pastoring was this. He was able to introduce me to certain vital relationships and those relationships expanded my capacity. It altered my value of my thinking process and has been able to bring me to where I am currently. So the question is this. How does the Spirit of God strategic connect us with strategic relationships and opportunities? One of the things it does is that it connects you with certain people and those certain people become doors that you enter through. When, when Israel sent the elders to go into the land of Jericho and they went to spider land, there was a woman in that land that was called Rahab. Rahab became a strategic relationship that helped their escape. Guess what? As Rahab helped their escape, Rahab also became preserved in the process. There are people that their purpose in your life is to open the door for a next level. My prayer is that you will not ignore them. Are, my prayer is that when things happen, you will not destroy or shut those relationships. Because when God says, I'm the one that opens the door and no man can shut. Let me tell you something. There's nothing that God does that doesn't do people. So when God says, I open a man, no man shall shut. In other words, there will be I'll be walking through a man that will open the door. If you are not good with identifying these relationships or understanding the leading of the Holy Spirit in these relationships, what will happen is that you'll, be find, you'll find yourself shutting doors and shutting doors and shutting doors at yourself. So how does God lead? I've, I've explained to you this before. I said the fundamental way, I, I've explained that the ways that God leads us. Number one, God leads us by his word. That, what does that mean? The word of God has the voice of God behind it. What does that mean? If I'm reading the Bible right now, I'm reading the Bible, but the Bible said the letter kill it, but the spirit give it life. As I'm reading the Bible, the voice in the word begins to speak to me. So why don't many Christians receive from the Bible? The reason is this. They approach the word of God with extreme carelessness. They approach the word of God with no expectation. So they go to the word and nothing happens. But the Bible says, blessed is he that believeth, but there shall be performance. The Bible says the expectation of the righteous shall not be cut short. That means as I approach the word of God today, there is a staring in my heart based on my expectation. And that expectation causes something to happen to me that will change my life for completely. I'm saying so to you because this happened when you hear the voice of God. When you have a challenge, I've told you, go to the Bible. As you read, let your expectation be clear. Lord, I want to speak to me about the, how we are going to come out of the loss we are in as a company. As you are reading, you'll be surprised. Out of the pages of the scripture, the Rema word of God will leap out. The prophetic word of God will be stead in your spirit. And the Bible says like this. The Bible says that thy word is lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. Once the light shines, this is what light does. If you go into a dark room where there's no, where you don't know what is there. As soon as you put on the light, you are able to see in a distinct manner, and you're able to take better decisions. So when the light of God floods your spirit through his word, you are able to go back to that your company where you have made losses, where you have made no profit, and as you're looking through your strategy and process, you're, oh wow, we should be doing this right now. Oh wow, we should, how come you can see? Because all of a sudden there's illumination in your spirit, and that illumination begins to affect everything. And this is what I'll be talking about, you know, this Wednesday. I, I, I will be talking, I've spoken about the last Wednesday and this Wednesday, the light, I'm going to talk about the light of life. How in every believer, there's light in every believer. And that light provides illumination. So God leads us by his word. The other thing that God leads us by the inward weakness. I explained to you that the inward weakness is the weakness of the spirit within us. The inward weakness is not a voice. The inward weakness is not a um, um, it's not proactive. The inward weakness is the response of the weakness of the spirit in us. So how does the inward weakness work? And let me say this quickly here. Someone says, I never hear the voice of God. The truth is that God doesn't have to speak to you to lead you. God can just weakness in your heart. There's a thing, if a husband and wife go, a couple go out. There's a thing that a wife wants to buy something 
and just looking at the husband's disposition, he can tell if he's in agreement or not. That's a weakness. The husband did not say something, but he has said something. So you even hear the wife say something like, ah, why are you looking at me that way? You know why? That look is a weakness. You know, but if you notice something, that weakness of that husband is not something that comes on. The way weakness works is this. A weakness is a reactive leading. So when you expose a decision or a thought to it, it responds by either agreeing or disagreeing. By either antagonizing or supporting that concept. That is the inward weakness. And that's why the Bible says this. He said the spirit bears weakness within our spirit that we are the sons of God. The third thing that God leads us with is the inward voice. What is the inward voice? There are many voices in the scripture. There is the voice of God or the voice of the Holy Spirit. There is the voice of the human spirit, the inward voice. There is the voice of the mind. The voice of the man is reasoning. There is the voice of the flesh. The voice of the flesh is what? The voice of the flesh is feeling. There is the voice of people. There is the voice of Satan. There are different kind of voices. But what we're talking about is not the voice of God, is not the voice of Satan, is the voice of the spirit within. And the way it's different is this. If you are not careful, you can, you can confuse it with the voice of God or the voice of the Holy Spirit. The voice of the Holy Spirit, when it comes, it comes very authoritatively. You will hear the Holy Spirit tell Philip, get thee down to Gaza. That is the inward, that is the audible voice of the Holy Spirit. It comes with a, you know, with a sort of command. The inward weakness might be what we call the still small voice. It's that small voice. It can be similar to the voice of the conscience. It's that small voice that will come out of you and say, no, 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 slow down. You're in a hurry. No, 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 do this. You're in a hurry. And that is the inward voice. That is the inward voice. And this is how God leads us. God also leads us by dreams. You know, people always ask me a question. Someone says, um, excuse me, sir. Um, someone says, if I don't dream, that means that my spiritual eyes and ears are deaf. Let me tell you something. Those are extra biblical materials. There's nothing like that. Those are, those are jargons of religions. Someone says, if I don't dream, that means my spiritual ears are deaf. Those are jargons of religion. For, and I'll prove it to you. Jesus never dreamt. Whose eyes and ears of the spirit was more open than him? Yeah. Jesus, there's no recorded dream of Jesus in the Bible. So does that mean that Jesus' ears and ears was, was deaf? No. So if you do not dream, as a matter of fact, when you read the Bible very well, you see that the Old Testament was full of dreams. The New Testament, there were dreams, but not in proportion to the Old Testament. Someone says, okay, sir, if I see a dream, um, what is the middle of my dream? It's very simple. If you want to know the middle of your dream, you don't go to a book. You go to the person that gave you a dream. When you read the Bible, most people that look for interpretation to their dreams were unbelievers. Because they were receiving spiritual signals, but their spirit was dead. So they had to look for someone that had the spirit of God. When Joseph dreamt, he knew what his dream meant. When Daniel dreamt, he knew what the dream meant. But when Nebuchadnezzar dreamt, he did not have understanding of what the dream was. So, when you are looking for a textbook that says, when you see fish in your dream, it means your life is slow. When you see snail, it means this and this and this. You are going to extra biblical material. Because the Bible is the center of revelation. And it does not even provide us those kinds of sources. How do people say that when you see this in your dream, this happens here? Someone says, when you eat in your dream, it means you have eaten poison. Those are not biblical materials. How do they get them? What they do is that they hear the testimony of people that had eaten their dreams and what they did and what they meant. And they write something based on that. That's not the Bible. Those are human experiences. The Bible says we should compare scripture with scripture. So when you have a dream, someone says, well, um, I ate in my dream. And I always say this. I say, if I eat in my dream, I know one thing. It's only God that is feeding me. That's all. I'm telling you. So I say, how do you know that? The reason why is this. Satan is too stingy to feed in the dream. I'm telling you the truth. Satan is stingy. There's nobody as selfish as Satan. He's too stingy to feed in the dream. Apart from God, God told me I, I should expect to be fed. What does he say? He says, thou prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. That means even those people that I saw in the dream that were tied with their hands and wearing red cloths, they were the people that got tied down. He says, because he wanted me to eat before them. They were tied down so that my food would not be disturbed. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. You know, there are some dimensions I want to go into today, but I'm going to cover in the midweek service. And I want to say something, make time this midweek and be there. Because more than the fact that we're fasting and praying, the teaching of the word of God will bet light in your spirit. So then, 
How can I be sure that this is the voice of God? First John chapter, chapter 4 verse 1. How can I be sure? So, I, because I've spoken about how the Spirit of God wants to connect in strategic relationships, how the Spirit of God wants to bet new ideas in your spirit. But someone says, how do I know what I'm hearing is the voice of God? First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. Verse 1. It said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. Well, the context of this is this. Whatever you hear that the claim is of God, there must be yardstick in which you are able to make a decision that this leading, this information is of the Spirit of God and this other one is not from the Spirit of God. So someone says that, um, Pastor, I heard something and God told me that that, that, man that, is, that that man that is over there, that his wife is my other sister's friend, he said, that is my husband. He said, so I've been believing and confessing. And let me tell you something, this happens in real time. I've seen people that are claiming people's husbands, claiming people's house in the name of Jesus Christ because the way that God has spoken to them. This is what I have to say to you. I know that you have heard something. What you should do is to ask yourself, what am I hearing? Because there are many voices. I've just explained to you that there are literally 12 voices in the Bible. 12 different kind of voices. But what, what, what voice am I hearing? So how do I know if I'm trying to make a decision, if I'm trying to make a, a, a marital decision, I have three beautiful ladies before me. I have Shinene, I have Shininqua, I have Latasha. And three of them are wonderful Christians. They are all doing well. They are on my specification. Well brought up, which one will I choose? And as you are praying, one says choose Shinene. How do I know it's Shinene? Are there yardsticks to measure? I'm trying to make an investment decision. And this investment decision, I have this 350 million naira that I've just recouped for my last investment. And I'm thinking, should I do a joint venture partnership? Should I do a joint venture? Should I go into some partnership? Should I go into real estate? Should I just hold on to the cash? Should I keep the money in dollars? Are you wondering? And as you're praying, you are having conflicting thoughts in your spirit, what I should do. These are the five steps you use to filter the leadings so that you can accurately know what God is saying to you. Number one, does this guidance align with the word of God? That's the first thing. Every guidance must pass the word test. You know why? Because the word of God is the supreme source of all revelation. Every revelation that does not align with the word of God is not of God. So if you hear a voice that says to you, go and marry a second wife, what you just say is that get deep behind me, Satan. Because that is not the will of God for you. If you hear a voice that says that your wife has done that, just make sure you beat her and slap her. That's not the voice of God because the Bible says you treat your wife as a sister in Christ. That's what the Bible says. If you hear a voice that says, this is what you have to do so that you can become a big giver in church, go and defraud people, you will understand that that's not the voice of God because God's voice always aligns with this word. The second thing to do is this. When God speaks to you, there will be peace. There will be peace. You know why? The Bible says one of the things that God used to guard our heart is peace. He says, and the peace of God that surpasses understanding. When God speaks to you, this is, a, this is very powerful. This is very powerful. He says, and the peace of God that surpasses understanding. What does that mean? You are in a fix. You are in debt. You don't know how to pay staff salary. You are stuck. You have lost your job. Your wife just walked out of the marriage. Your relationship just collapsed. He says, when you hear God, the way you know is God is this. He said, there will be peace that will surpass your heart. That peace will not be explainable. It will not be based on physical circumstances. He said, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You look at yourself, there's no natural reason why you should be at peace. But this peace is so powerful, the, the under church just says that it will mount guards behind your heart and soul. That's what it does. So you are going through something. There was a time I was traveling and all of a sudden they said that there was, you know, something in the air. And it was only, and the place just said, Brugba, Brugba, ah, everything, Jesus, Jesus. People were just shouting. The, I was next to a white lady, she grabbed that chair, she grabbed that chair, she was going to break it. Ah, ah. You know, I, I thought I was strong. When the plane just dropped, boom, I said, what? Ah, I just brought out the word. I said, Lord, is this it? He said, when you told them, you said, you're coming back home, right? I said, you're coming back. I said, thank you, Lord. When he said that, I reclined my chair, took my duvet, and slept. Because sometimes, in the midst of the storm, so that you don't doubt, or say the wrong thing, sleep off. Where did I learn from? I learned from Jesus Christ. When the storm was hitting the boat, 
And the disciples were wondering, what did he do? He was busy sleeping. You are looking at your bank account too much. That's your problem. You are looking at, the, at NCDC's number too much. That's the problem. You are looking at financial time status too much. That's the problem. You have to sleep. You know why? When you sleep, you give God room to operate. That's why Adam had to sleep so that God can walk on man. What does sleep mean? You enter into a place of rest. So concerning your business, you enter into a place of rest. Someone say, I'm 35, I'm not married. My sister, enter into a place of rest, sir. My brother, enter into a place of rest. That's the second way you know. The third way you know the guidance of the Holy Spirit is this. The guidance and of the Holy Spirit and the counsel of people that God has used to guide you before will be in sync. All of the time. The Bible says, in the multitude of cancer, there's safety. I never said the cancer of anybody. There are people that you have submitted yourself to or taught in the local church. When you bring forth guidance to them, they will be able to cancel you because God knows you can go astray. So he left the, he left the local church there. He says, in the multitude of cancer, there's safety. Most people are not able to walk with God's will and walk with God's guidance, especially through the ministry of the local church. And the last thing is this, I, I wish I could go finish all of that, about how God leads people, is this, God's guidance is going to align with his plan and the purpose for your life. The purpose of God for your life cannot be in Japan and God says move to Canada. God is not the author of confusion. There are people, if you meet them today, what, it, it seems as if they forgot what God said yesterday. It seems as if God changes his mind. You know, I asked a pastor, I said, what are you, um, how far with this? He said, oh, I, well, I, I can't remember. I said, but why are you getting confused? God does not change. Him. God cannot say, do this today and change mind to tomorrow. You know why? Because God's decisions are not subject to time. He makes the decision before the, before the foundation of the world. So if you find that they are having a leading, so all of a sudden you have a call to the ministry, next thing, or maybe you have a call to something, next thing is an opportunity somewhere, and you forget that call. What happens to you is this. You are moving out of God's leading. You are moving. And the reason why I put that is this. Because temporarily, some things stay nice. You can make money from it. It seems easy. But eventually, it will be trouble. So the question as we begin to round up is this. How do I connect with strategic relationships and opportunities through the guidance of the Holy Spirit? The first thing I've said to you is this. The reason why this is important is this. God uses relationships to open doors for you. God uses relationships to build you. I'm telling you, God uses relationships to open doors for you. There was a part that Jonathan played in the life of David. Listen, Saul was after David, but Jonathan and David went into a strategic relationship. There are people in your life right now that God wants to use them to open doors. I'm praying in the name of Jesus Christ that you will locate them. In the name of Jesus, you will have the wisdom to find them. So the question today is this. How does the Spirit of God connect me with strategic relationships? Strategic relationships. The Bible says in the book of Ruth that, you know, Ruth's husband and the brother had married two. They were had two wives. It was Ruth and, um, and the sister-in-law. But when tough time came, what happened? The Bible says the sister-in-law packed her thing. It was a tough decision and went. But Ruth cleaved to her mother-in-law. What happened? Ruth is one of the few Gentiles that appears in the genealogy of Jesus Christ just because she was able to identify strategic relationship. When the mother-in-law says, there's nothing I can do for you again. There's no child to bear. Everything is finished. He said, listen, persuade me not to go back. He said, your people shall be my people. Your God will be my God. Ah, what did the woman say? The woman said to her, he said, won't I now look for rest for you? So much so that Ruth now became one of the people in the genealogy of David and of Jesus Christ ultimately. I'm saying to you here that one of the things the Holy Spirit wants to use to bring together that explosion, one of the things the Holy Spirit wants to help you to bring together your goals is to strategically connect to relationships. What religion has done is this. We are just going to be praying, praying, praying. Gah, 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 gah. You know, and it's amazing. You know the thing, you are praying, some of you, you are praying and your prayer is working against you. I'll give an example. Imagine someone that is dating someone and that dating is a wrong dating. As you are praying, Lord, I must leave him. I command him to go in Jesus' name because there will be a God for me. That's what you are saying in tongues. But in the physical, you are saying, Father, please give it to him. I love me. So that's why it's not working. Because you don't understand those, those dynamics. So, how does the Holy Spirit connect you? I, I've given you examples. How does the Holy Spirit connect you with people? The first, what do you have to do? The first thing is this. You have to trust God with your goals. And uh, let me say something. 
As simple as this is, a lot of people do not know what it means to vitally trust God with your goal. The best people do is to take their prayer request and say, Father, this is it. How do you trust God with your, with your goals? You take your goals to God in prayer. And please, I want to teach you the practical art. As you take it to God in prayer, you say, Lord, these are my goals. You pray on it. You say, Spirit of God, this is, I'm asking you to show me what you have me do. And God will begin to show you something. What happens is this. Most of us do what we have to do. I want God to bless it. Let me say something to you. For you to blow is easy. All you need is for, is for God to blow on it. I'm telling you. When God blows on a man, the man blows up. Praise God. When God blows on a man, the man blows up. The business is not working because heaven has not blown on it. You know, everybody can talk about it. But when, see, when God turns on you, it becomes your turn. God cannot turn on a man and it doesn't become your turn. Hey, you can have heaven's attention and earth will not stand as still for you. So you take the goals to God and this is a goal in a very practical way. Lord, our goal is that this year our company is going to have 400 staff. We're going to make 8.4 billion naira as turnover. Holy Father, I have, I, I have ideas on what to make it happen. But my ideas are nothing compared to your ideas. You take it. And let me say this just something. This is not a prayer you pray one day. It's a prayer you go about, you pray, pray. Why do you say, why do you keep praying? The reason why is this. The nature of guidance, please notice this. Because I want to you something deep about guidance. The nature of guidance is this. Sometimes all guidance does not come at once. There's the way Apostle Paul says it. He said we prophesy in part. And we know in part. He said, when that which is whole comes, the part will be done away with. So as I'm praying today, the danger of Pentecostals is this. They take a part and run as if it's whole. So they get stuck. My brother, before you take an action, just remember what you have as a part. God has said, invest. Invest what? Invest when? Invest with who? You don't get those instructions. All you just hear is invest. You now go and put your money somewhere and say, God has fed me. Ha, God, ha, ha, and I'm a tighter. Uh, that's not what you do. You trust God with your goals. You take the goals to God. And as you take the goals to God, you begin, you know, see, God told Isaac in a very clear way. He said, Isaac, don't go down to Egypt. He said, stay in the land I will show you. The Bible says, and Isaac sold. Now, that is the weapon because I miss it. Because, he said, and he sold. But what you don't see is that, God showed Isaac how to dig well and how to do it with irrigation. And it was that irrigation that brought about the hundredfold. So, so, they, so Isaac sold. The reason why is this, and this is why a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians are fighting and giving, but there's no commensurate output of generosity result in their lives. And that's the reason. This is the reason why. Because generosity does not, does not occur because of a practice of faith or giving alone. It works with instruction. Everywhere there was divine provision in the Bible, there was instruction. One of the instructions had to do with their giving. So that's where you start from. You start by being a committed tither. You start by being committed in your offering. And as you do that, there are further instructions coming. Most Christians do that. Once they give and tithe, that's all. No, sir. The Bible says when you tithe, it will open the windows of heaven. What comes out of window is not food. What comes out of window is heavenly ideas. The capacity to see into the mind of God and tap into the wisdom of God to pull ideas is open to you. So by the power of your spirit, you withdraw those ideas into the natural realm. How do you do that? As soon as you participate in your giving, you open up your spirit in the atmosphere of thanksgiving. You become like Solomon when he gave 1,000 offering. God appeared at night to him. The reason why you give and God does not appear to you is you are not even expecting God to appear. Whatever you do, including your giving, if it's not based on faith, it's a waste of time. So, when you participate in your giving, you open up your spirit and let the thought, the wisdom, the ideas of God fill your mind. Let me tell you something. You mean God does not know the ideas that will happen tomorrow. Of course he does. Why can't I tell them to you? Because in your mind, you are not even thinking that way. Most believers are thinking of what can I have that I can eat right now? That's what we're thinking. What can I have? Just, I just need to, I just need one million, one million. One million. God says these are not ready. Listen, in, <laughs> oh glory to God. The story of the prodigal son is very instructive. When the prodigal son was suffering, he told his friends, he said, in my father's house, there are hired servants that are not sons that are eating and feeding well. What was he saying? He said, when the sons become prodigal, God will use people that are not sons to fill his purpose. 
I'm telling you, there are people that are not born again right now that are feeding well because they don't understand dynamics of, of sonship, but they understand how to work as servants. And God wants to open you up to it. So let's conclude this. So what you have to do is to trust God with your goals. So the first thing I want to say is this. Do you even have goals at all? Someone says, I have goals. But uh, listen to me. Whatever is not written down is not a goal. It's a wish. Goals are clearly written down. Writing down goals is so powerful to God and important to God. So much. Let me tell you why it's so important. This was what shocked me in my own, own life. I read the Bible one day and I saw that someone had a vision. And vision. And I had the vision. It was carried away. And an angel tapped him and said, away, take pen and write. Ah! It was so important for him to write. An angel gave him a pen from heaven and said, you have to write this. If God thinks of spectacular vision needs to be documented, how come you think your own goal will not be documented? The reason why many people are stuck is this. You cannot score in life if you don't have a goal. Oh yes. What, when you live without goals, it's like playing football without goal posts. You will play till tomorrow, you can never score. That's how many Christians are living. And sometimes, what are your goals? Are your goals operational goals or their strategic goals? There are some people that God cannot speak into their life because of the way they're thinking. So you have the goals, you have the goals, you have the goals. So when you have the goals, when you have the goals, what do you do? You go to God in prayer and submit it to God. So the reason why some people are afraid to submit this goal to God is this, because of fear. That's true. Because they're afraid. They're really afraid. They are very afraid. But trust God. So when you submit this goal to God, what, does, what, what do you do? Let me tell you how God now connects his strategic relationship. As you submit this goal to God and you begin to pray and think, two things will happen to you. Number one, God will begin to show you problems you have to solve. God will begin to show you people that you have to help. What people do not understand is this. You don't enter strategic relationship from a place of I need help. Uh-uh. You enter strategic relationship from a place of I need solution. I have solution for you. And the, the, person might not, the person God leads you to might not even be the person that can help you. The person can just be a doorkeeper. That he opens the door. Once you enter that place, it will happen. Just imagine Esther. It was Esther's uncle Mordecai that opened the door for Esther to become a queen. I'm telling you something. It might be your house up. It might be cleaner. Some of the biggest relationships in my life have been through people that I didn't even consider were anybody. But they had a certain connect. And as they mentioned, you know, one of the, one, one of the relationships I very relationship in my life, the guy told me, he said, that, you know why I love you, sir? He said, because this person spoke about you and I know that person is a nobody. But the way he says you handle and talk to him, I say, ah, that pastor knows you personally. You mean he does this for you? Wow. That means he's not even impressed on how big you are. I would like to meet him. And what does the Bible say? Hebrews, 10, Hebrews 13 verse 2. It says we should be careful and learn from Abraham that we we'll entertain strangers unaware. So how does God lead us? As you begin to pray, God will begin to notch relationship with you. It can be your house help. It can be, the, it can be this, it can be that. It can be to people that you must serve. You must, you must begin to give to. So it's going to happen in two ways. Number one, there will be relationships that you have to serve. You enter into those relationships and start serving. And you don't serve because you expect something. Because your God that is in heaven will supply you wholly. The second thing is this, which is the final thing I will say today. As those, as you are there, there will also be problems that people have. And God has designed you to solve that problem. What everybody did not see was this. That Goliath was an opportunity. Only David saw that Goliath was an opportunity. As you are praying, 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 you will just see a problem in your office. How come we are spending 10 million every year on this? This simple solution can bring it out. You are not even planning for it to, for you to be noticed. You fix that problem. One day in, the, in your meetings, the MD says, we saved 10 million here. How did that happen? They tell, they tell him how. They say, wow, who did that? They say, oh, it was Ayasunde. They say, call out for me. Give you double promotion. But the reason why people don't do that is that they will ask themselves, what's my business the problem? The thing that kills strategic relationship that the Holy Spirit guides you into is selfishness. Because when God leads into a relationship, if it does not look like a relationship that can profit you, you just shut it down. But listen to me. <laughs> the person that will tell you where your leprosy can come up from can be your house help. The person that will tell you where your leprosy can come out from can be your house help. It was the house help of Naaman that told Naaman that in Israel, there is a man of God that can help him. 
I'm saying so to you because you are here. Some of you are watching this thing right now. And deep down in you, you are remembering relationships. You are, some of some people God put in your life and you're about to cut them out. Listen to me. Cut them out and cut away your destiny. I'm telling you. You say, what do you mean? Ask Lot. Cut them out and cut away your destiny. That's what happens. And in this season, how are you going to get there? By submitting your goals to God. As you submit your goals to God, remember, not of all opportunities are monetary. Some human beings are opportunities. So you begin to say, Lord, is this what you want me to be? Is this a relationship I should repair? Go back to it. You begin to pray, Lord, guide me in this process. And as it does that, that will happen. Then you will not ask, who should I be serving? Some of you are here. I've spoken about the end poverty project. You are eating some shosti. Things are okay with you. You are not poor. You will say, how can I be able to help at this moment? I can I be able to help, be a blessing to others, able to help the poor, or able to help the church at this season? Because why? The Bible says in Hebrews 13:2, it says, Be not forgetful that Abraham entertained angels unaware, and that turned around his life forever. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you, and we thank you for your word again. We're asking in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you minister to us today. You'll grant us wisdom. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.